Well, good morning, church. Good morning. All right. What a, what a great opportunity we have to come into the house of the Lord today and to celebrate his son, Jesus Christ. And just by a hand clap of praise this morning, who all is going to help me do that? Amen. All right. Amen. Well, my name's Jeff, and as always, it's a, it's a great, oper- it's a great um, joy and a pleasure to be here just to lead through these songs and just to try to usher in the Holy Spirit. And that's what we want to do is as we lift up the name of Jesus today. You know, we don't do it just because we just like the songs or, we, or any of that, e- even though that may be true. The real reason is to usher in the Holy Spirit, to prepare our hearts for the Word. And today, I pray that you would help us do that. So don't be afraid to lift up your voices and clap along and to sing and make some noise before the Lord today. So if you will, let's stand together and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to come be a part of our service because... We don't want to do it without him guiding us and leading us and directing us in our worship time today. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for just this place we have to come and to worship you. And dear Lord, I pray today, if there's anything that's in our way of coming before you and worshiping you for who you are, I pray that we move those things to the side and we focus on you today pray that we lay down the burdens of this world, and I pray that we have the courage to leave them there at the foot of the cross where they belong. As we give our lives over to you, as we give this time over to you, we pray your forgiveness of the things that we've said and done that are throughout the week that have gotten ourselves in trouble, maybe things that people don't even know about that we do. I pray your forgiveness over those. I pray we come into your presence today clean hands, awaiting the outpouring of your spirit. Pray for Brother Ryan today as he brings the message. I pray that each word that's spoken would just pierce right through our hearts of stone and give us hearts of flesh, something that you can work in. I pray that as we leave this place today, that we will be somehow drawn closer to you by what happens here. And all these things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we think about this morning, think about this. Where would we be without our Lord and Savior? And that's exactly what this song talks about. If you know the word, sing along with us this morning. Ready?
glory today. We thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice that you made, and we also thank you for being the cornerstone of our faith. Amen. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lift in Jesus' name.
the Lord a hand today. Amen. He is our cornerstone. Amen. And we're so thankful for him. And church, you may be seated. Well, amen. Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. He is the reason we do everything that we do here in this church. And it is so good to be in the house of the Lord and exalt him and lift up his holy name. Amen. You might have noticed in front of you, if you're a first-time guest, that there is a card. And if you don't mind to scan this top scan, it will take you to a connection card. We would be grateful if you fill that out for us. That will help us to get to know you as you get to know us as well. I want to take a few moments to share some announcements at this time because we're going to have a Lord's Supper service at the end of the service, and we won't have time to do that. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to introduce you to some new members. And so... This is a family that is going to be joining our church from a sister church, so they're going to be joining by letter. We have uh, Randy Cortez, Venetia Cortez, Scotty Cortez, and Elizabeth Cortez. If you guys will wave at us here for a minute. If you rejoice in them joining our fellowship, would you signify by saying amen? Amen. Praise God. Glad to have the Cortez family. I know God has a great plan for them here at this church. Also, be sure to take a note at the worship guide. There are several announcements. Don't forget, next week is the deadline for the Costa Rica mission trip. Guys, it's going to be a great mission trip, and, and if you're praying about it, be, be sure to let me know about it. It's going to be a wonderful trip. A lot of evangelism, a lot of good things going on there. The dates are listed there. Still collecting for the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. We're doing that until November 21st. Still got a couple weeks, but don't forget about it. Also, uh, tonight at 4 o'clock, we will be having our quarterly business meeting. So everybody's invited to that. We need a good showing. This is a very important meeting. You might have had the opportunity to look at the proposed budget. We're going to have questions and answers on that budget at this business meeting. Also, I've been asked to announce that the senior adults are having their uh, Bible study tonight, and I am going to be opening up the Book of Romans tonight with them, doing an introduction. So that will be in the senior hall starting at 5 o'clock. Let's go ahead and have a time of prayer, and let's just devote this time over to Jesus. God, you are so good to us. And Father, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to be in your house and to uplift your holy name. And Jesus is our cornerstone. He is the reason we do everything that we do. And I pray, God, that your word would just prevail over our hearts and that we would surrender before you today, knowing that you are a God who is worth serving. God, we've gotten wrapped up in so many things in our life, so many distractions, and I pray, God, that we would just confess those distractions, those sins, whatever it might be, so that we can focus on you and give you our very best today because you are deserving of it. So excited about what you're going to do in our hearts and in our lives today, and I just pray you continue to receive our praise. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. stand with us because Christ is our cornerstone of faith he can use anything in our lives to turn it into something good for him including our scars the things that we've gotten ourselves into things that we're ashamed of that's what this song talks about if you know I'd like for you to sing along with us So I'm thankful for the sky. 
sacrifice you've made for us. And congregation, you may be seated in just a moment. Sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my life, thou hast told me to say, it is well. So
connect with this church as we sing this one more time. Amen. Amen. It's now time for Children's Church, ages 4 through 1st grade. Glad to have each of you here today. Love our kids at First Baptist. Appreciate y'all so much. <laughs> so I wrote a poem for each of you today. I hope that you like it. You ready for it? Here it is. Hold on now. Don't get too excited, I promise. But here it is. I dig, you dig, he digs, she digs, it digs. We dig, they dig. What do you think? It's not my best poem, but it does get pretty deep. <laughs> Today we're going to dig deeper into the book of First Peter. The last time that we met, the Apostle Peter had given us instruction that we need to long for the Word of God like a newborn infant is longing for her mother's milk. And so today we're going to continue Along that path, and we're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 4. God's holy and inspired, inerrant word says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ for it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in me will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. Thank you so much for your word, and I pray, God, that as your word is spoken, we don't listen to it like we're watching a movie or we're just paying attention to something on the radio, but God, I pray that we listen because we know you speak to us through your word. I, I know, God, that you speak directly to our hearts, and so I pray that your Holy Spirit would anoint me and pray that we were all drawn to the cross of Christ today and that we would see that you are indeed precious. And I pray today, if there's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray they would repent of their sin and place their faith in the cornerstone who is Christ Jesus. We love you today and pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. At the end of verse 3 of 1 Peter chapter 2, there is a little phrase that says, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. And it's important for us, no matter what you've been through this week, to remind ourselves that God is good, regardless of our circumstances. In fact, John MacArthur had this quote. He said, the original Saxon meaning 
of the word God was the good, indicating that centuries ago, God's name was synonymous with goodness. And I love that quote because it reminds me that when it comes to goodness, that is God's business. Everything he does is good. If a God allows something in our life, God has a good plan for us. You see, God saw us in our sinful condition. We had rebelled against him. We'd rebelled against his word. We've disobeyed the things that he's asked us to do. We have all become sinners. And yet God has a good plan for us. And this passage of scripture talks about God's good plan for us. This is not one of man's uh, opinions. This is not something that somebody sat down and made up in their mind. This is God's plan for our salvation. And it is a good, good plan. And we see that Jesus is the cornerstone of that plan. If we look in the text, what we see first off is that Jesus is the living stone. Jesus is the living stone. You notice it there in verse 4. It says, as you come to him, a living stone. God's good plan had to have a savior, and only Jesus would work. He is called the living stone because Jesus has defeated death, He has risen from the grave, and he is alive today. There is no plan B. Jesus is the only plan for us in order for us to know God, in order for us to be saved. Every other religion has a shaky foundation because the founder of the religion is dead and still in the grave, but Jesus has risen from the grave, and so God has declared him to be the cornerstone of his good plan. In other words, if you want to get to God, you have to get to God the way God says that you can get to him, and it's only through Christ. There is no other way. And By calling Jesus a stone, Peter is saying that he is the rock on which the church rests. Without a sure foundation, every building will fall. And so God chose Jesus to be the surest of the foundation for the church and also for our salvation. All other ground is sinking sand, but it's on Christ, the solid rock in which we stand. And so Jesus is that living stone. But we also see in verse 4 that Jesus is chosen and precious to God. You notice in verse 4 it continues there, a living stone rejected by men. But in the sight of God, he is chosen and precious. Back when Solomon was building his temple, a lot of the workers would prepare the stones for that temple according to the blueprint that King David had put together. And so what they did is they would off-site cut every single stone and made sure every stone was perfectly fitted onto the other stone. And then they would carry these stones to the site in which the temple was going to be. These temple stones were set precisely together like it was a huge puzzle. And that compares to how God chose Christ as the foundation on which to build his spiritual temple. Regardless of what the world thinks about Jesus, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus is still the cornerstone who was chosen and who was precious, and upon him, God is going to build his church. He is the chosen and honored servant. So that word precious that we see translated there means that Jesus is unequaled in value. It means that he is irreplaceable. Jesus is irreplaceable Because he is the most precious of all stones of the building. He is the cornerstone. And the cornerstone has three specific functions. One of the functions of a cornerstone is that it sets all the angles of the building. So all of the angles of the building come from that cornerstone. The cornerstone also serves as a plumb line. And it sets the horizontal and the vertical lines of the building. Furthermore, we see that the cornerstone establishes the precise symmetry of the building. And so in saying all of this, if you get the cornerstone wrong, everything about the building is going to be wrong. The foundation is going to fall apart. And so God made sure that the foundation, the cornerstone of his building, his church, was Jesus Christ. He had to be flawless. He had to be perfect, and Jesus is flawless. He is perfect, and all of the church was to be in line with the cornerstone. That's the way that God set up this church, and we see this even further because 
not only is Jesus the living stone and, and Jesus is chosen and precious to God, but Jesus is also the fulfillment of Scripture. In verses 6 through 8, you see Peter begin to quote some Scripture. And any time the word rock or stone is used in the Old Testament, it was in reference to a messianic title. And so the Jews, when they read about a stone or they read about the rock who was going to come and be the foundation of God's church, they knew they, that the, uh, the writer was talking about the Messiah who was to come. And here, Peter is applying several of those texts about that rock, about that stone to Jesus. And Peter is saying, here is the fulfillment of Scripture. He is the one that God has chosen. He is the one that is that cornerstone, and he is the one that we can trust in. In verse 6, there is a reference to Isaiah 28, verse 16. This is an important messianic statement that promised that Christ would be the cornerstone of God's new spiritual house, which is going to be the church. In verse 7, you see a quote from Psalm 118, verse 22, that the builders rejected the cornerstone. God had a special plan, and his plan was the only plan for salvation, but many people did reject the Messiah, and many people still do reject the Messiah. And then in verse 8, you see a quote from Isaiah chapter 8, verse 14. And so in each of these instances, you see that Christ is the fulfillment of these scriptures, showing that he is the Messiah, he is the rock, he is the living stone, he is the one upon God that has chosen, said, if you want salvation, it's got to come through my way. It's got to come through that cornerstone. And so in light of that, since we know Jesus is the cornerstone that God has chosen, he's not the cornerstone because I chose him. He's the cornerstone because God chose him. He's precious in God's eyes. He fits perfectly with God's design. So there's really, there are just two ways in which we can respond to this cornerstone. There are only two ways, two possible ways to respond to God's perfect and good plan for us. They are this. Number one, you can receive Christ. Or number two, you can reject Christ. There is no third option here. You can receive Christ or you can reject Christ. God says this is the way to be saved. This is the way to build the church. But if we say, no, I don't like that way, we're rejecting God's only way to be saved. Or we can receive it. In verse number 4, you notice in the beginning of uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 4, it says, as you come to him. That phrase, come to him, speaks about drawing near for salvation, but it also speaks about a desire to stay with him, a desire to have an intimate connection with him. You see, when you're saved, it's not a matter of, well, I just want to have insurance in case heaven really is real. No, it's about wanting a relationship with God. When you come to him, you recognize that you are a sinner and that he is the only Savior. And you come before him and say, God, I want to know you. I want to spend the rest of my days growing close to you. You are my cornerstone. I want to align my life with you. I want the angles of my life, the thoughts of my mind to be consistent with the cornerstone. That's who I want to be. So when you're saved, you are saying, I'm acknowledging that you're God, your Savior, not me. And I want to live for you. You come to Jesus. That's how you receive him. Or many people, including the people of Jesus' day and people every single day, lots of people are preaching the word of God this Sunday morning all across the world, and there are people who will receive him, but there's also going to be a group of people who reject him. Notice in verse 4, it speaks about the living stone that is rejected by men. In verse 7, it speaks about the stone that the builders rejected. Now, this word rejected is a fascinating word. You understand what it means to reject something, but what the word means, actually, is to reject after careful examination. So the picture is, is that God picks the stone that is to be the cornerstone, and everybody else comes around and looks at the stone from every angle and says, I look at that stone and I deem it to be unworthy. That is a stone that is useless. That is not a cornerstone. That stone shouldn't be in the building whatsoever. God said, this is the stone. And man said, not my stone. Rejected the chief cornerstone. 
They essentially said, I don't want that Jesus to be the cornerstone of my life. I'm not going to allow him to be the foundation for my life. I'm not going to live for him. You see, this Jesus that we talk about, he was not the Messiah that many of the Jews were hoping for. Many of the Jews were wanting a Messiah who would overthrow the Romans. They wanted the Messiah to be a great king that would come in and sit on a throne and everybody say, wow, how great Israel is because of how great their king is. They didn't want a Messiah that was going to hang out with sinners and a Messiah that would die like a thief on the cross. They looked at that cornerstone and they said, I reject that. I don't want to have anything to do with that stone because it doesn't fit what I want for my life. And they turned and walked away from it. But God's plan required that before Jesus would come on a white horse, he first had to come on a donkey. Before he would reign and rule over the nations, he first had to humble himself and die on the cross for man's sins. And the reason why Jesus came first, we're celebrating Christmas, he came born in the manger and he went to the manger so that he would go to the cross. And the reason is, is because he wanted your heart first. He knew that there was separation between you and God. And so he came and did everything possible in order to mend that broken relationship by giving his life on the cross. And he says, whoever believes in me will be saved and they will willingly follow the King of kings and Lord of lords. But before he became an exalted king, he first had to be a suffering servant. So this is the question I want you guys to think about today. And I'm going to ask it again at the end of the message. Have you received or rejected Christ as the foundation for your life? This question is so very important. Don't pass it by and think, I'll just wait to the next thing, I'll think about that. I want you to read that and think about that in your heart today. Because God said, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. There is no other way besides Jesus. And some of you that are here in this room are thinking about Jesus. You're examining it like those builders were examining that stone. And you walk away saying, I don't want that. I reject that. Only two responses here today, church. Receive him or reject him. There's no third option. So what I want to do today is I want to give you some benefits to receiving Jesus as the cornerstone of your life. And then we're going to wrap up with some consequences to rejecting Jesus. So let's look at the benefits of receiving Jesus, the blessings, the advantages to receiving Jesus, whatever you want to call it. But it all revolves around the fact that receiving Jesus Christ makes you new. You become a new creation, a new person. And it starts because you have a new identity. There are two references to our identity in this passage. If you notice in verse 4, the first identity is that the living stone, who we said is Jesus Christ, makes us, those who receive Jesus, also living stones. So Jesus is the living stone, and if you trust in him, and if you receive him, you also become a living stone. What this means then is that Christ makes you united with him, and you become united with all other believers. We're a part of the same spiritual building, and so when you are united with Christ, you also become united with your brother and sister in Christ. Why? Because we have the same cornerstone. Jesus is the living stone because he is resurrected and he has defeated death. Anyone that is saved has also been resurrected and they themselves have defeated death because of the blood of Jesus. And so we have that shared identity with Christ and with one another. The picture is of us getting quarried out of the pit of sin and then submitted by grace into the building. That's the picture We've been quarried out and we're this new stone and God shapes us and forms us and puts us right there on that building. He chose us. And so I want you to think about this here today. This means that we cannot be saved by anything we do. You can't come before God and say, look at me, I'd be a great stone for your building, God. I'd be the ideal stone for your church, God. Not anyone can say that. God chooses us and he sees us as we are. We're unfit. 
We're unworthy, we're, we're defiled, we're corrupted, and God takes us and he shapes us and he puts us with Christ so the cornerstone aligns our lives with his mission. We are living stones. We're chosen by God and built into the walls alongside of Jesus. And these living stones make up Christ's church, which is still being built as more and more people receive Jesus. We're living stones, which means we don't stay still. We were moving. We're doing what God has called us to do. And for both Jesus and us to be called living stones means that we are united with Christ, united with each other. We belong, we belong to the same Christ. We have the same goal. And so it's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about the cornerstone. Everything that we do is about the cornerstone. He's the foundation for my life. If you're in Christ, he should be the foundation for your life as well. We are living stones together established for that same purpose. So the first identity that Peter is establishing here for you is that if you are truly saved and you've received Christ, you are a living stone, just like Jesus is the living stone. A second identity we keep reading here is that we see that we are God's building, God's house. It says there in verse 5, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. The word spiritual house there speaks about the church. It speaks about the temple. And so it teaches us that as God's house, the Holy Spirit works in us and through us in order to reach the world. In the Old Testament, God's temple represented his presence. And so now that we are New Testament Christians... The Holy Spirit indwells within us, and so as living stones, spiritual buildings that Peter is calling us here, we consciously, daily submit ourselves to the rule and reign of the Holy Spirit. We come before the Holy Spirit, and we say, Holy Spirit, dominate my mind, dominate my life, that I might live for you, that I might work to establish and to build up your building, not my own. It's about your kingdom, not my kingdom. It's about what you want, not what I want. Not my will be done, but your will be done. That's what it means to be a part of God's spiritual house. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22, this passage is similar to what Peter's teaching here. He says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So when you are saved, the Holy Spirit indwells within you, and he doesn't just sit in you and think, well, I'm just going to be comfortable because I'm not going to do anything. He's continually making you more like that cornerstone so that you have the same mission and purpose of the cornerstone. That is an amazing identity. This is who you are in Christ. Don't believe any other lie. The Bible says that if you are saved, if you truly have received Jesus Christ, you are a living stone, and you are a part of God's building. That's who you are. But it's important to note this, church, that having that new identity means you also have a new purpose. You have a new purpose. And as we continue to read in verse 5, he establishes this purpose to be threefold. He says there that you're being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so we've established that we are living stones, that we are part of God's building. But what does this mean? It means now we have a job to do. There are responsibilities. And so let's start with the first responsibility. He says there in verse 5 that we are a holy priesthood. This means that we should live holy lives. Our identity in Christ changes how we live. If you are truly saved, then you are aligned, your life is getting aligned with that cornerstone. Because God has established his building and what it is supposed to look like. So we desire to live holy lives. We have seen in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, that we are as obedient children. We should be holy 
as the God who called us is holy. And here, Peter is calling us holy priests. To be holy means that you are pure. It means that you are separate. This means that you think differently, you act differently, and you love differently. To be holy does not mean that you isolate yourself from the world. But the idea is, is that you are in the world, but you're not of the world. Holy living is contact without contamination. So we try to be salt and light where God has put us, but we don't allow the things of the world to contaminate us. Why? Because we want to live pure and holy lives. Why? Because our God is pure and holy, and we represent him. As the cornerstone, Jesus aligns our lives to where they need to be. We're all a part of his body, and the way that we live affects other people. Imagine with me that today, maybe sometime after church, there is a tremendous earthquake that hits all of Hoax Bluff. The earthquake shakes all of your houses, and it greatly affects you. So much so that this earthquake affects the stories you tell. You're going to start talking to your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. You're going to say, let me tell you about that earthquake that shook up everything in Hoax Bluff that day. And you're going to tell that story, and you're going to tell it over and over again. Why? Because it greatly impacted everything. Here's what I want you to understand, that when you are saved, Jesus quakes your heart so that you are never the same, so that you should start telling your kids and grandkids, let me tell you what happened to me when I was saved, when God came into my life, when he changed my heart. My foundation was completely broken, but I gave it to Jesus, and he saved me. That is what happens when we give our lives to Jesus. So, when you talk about being a Christian and going to such and such church and signing the card and getting baptized, let me ask you this. Has Jesus made a difference in your life? Is it even worth talking about in your day-to-day living? You see, a lot of people have some kind of affiliation with Jesus and they know about Jesus, but they don't know him. They don't have a relationship with him. And they've never surrendered to Jesus being the foundation and the cornerstone of their lives. If you don't surrender, you say, yeah, I like the idea of going to heaven, but I don't want you to be my Lord. You have rejected him as cornerstone. You need to understand that, church. You say, I like that idea. I I, I like the idea of knowing you, but you don't really know him. You see, when you're saved, you live a holy life. But another way in which we have a shaped purpose is that we represent Christ as priest. This is an amazing concept. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but the Bible says that anyone that is truly in Christ is a priest unto God. That's what it says there. If you look at verse 5, it says there that we are built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. So if you're saved, you are a priest. Back in the Old Testament, only the Levites were the priests, right? But every Christian that is genuinely saved has direct access to God through Jesus Christ. And the priest also serves God personally when we bring other people to him. See, Paul Peter calls us in verse 5 a holy priesthood. In verse 9, he calls us a royal priesthood. This is an amazing privilege. In the Old Testament, only the high priest could go behind the Holy of Holies. And he could only do it one time a year on the Day of Atonement. Now, because of what Jesus has done for us, he is our great high priest. He has torn the veil when he died on the cross for our sins so that anyone who is in him is a priest so that we can go before God. We can worship. We can confess our sins to God. We can pray for others. We can confess whatever sins are holding us back. That is what we can do because we are priests unto God. We don't need someone else, a a human, to stand between us and God anymore because Jesus is our great high priest. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 4, verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. You are a priest unto God. You can go before God 
any time during the day, any time during the night. When you're having good days or bad days, whatever day of the week it is, you can go to God the Father. It's an amazing privilege. So, being a priest and living holy, what should we do? Well, if we, as we continue to read, this gives us the third purpose to being our, having our identity in Christ. It is that we should offer spiritual sacrifices. We should offer spiritual sacrifices. In the Old Testament, the main job of the priest was to offer animal sacrifices. But when Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, he shed his blood, animal sacrifices were no longer necessary. It's important to note this. In the Old Testament, not every sacrifice was by an animal being killed. A lot of the animal sacrifices dealt with our sin, and they were pictures of what Jesus was going to do on the cross for us. But there were also sacrifices that somebody could have given that were not dealing with the sin so much, but a heart of gratitude. And so they had something you can read about in Leviticus 2 called the grain offering. And the grain offering was that they could go before God, they could offer up a sacrifice of grain, not thinking it was, had anything to do with their sin, but they were merely responding to God and saying, God, I'm so grateful for your goodness. I'm so grateful for how good you've been to my nation, to my family. And so I'm offering you this sacrifice of grain. That sacrifice of grain is a picture of us as New Testament believers today where we offer spiritual sacrifices not in order to be saved, but we offer these spiritual sacrifices because we are saved. We are grateful for what God has done for us. And so we come before God and say, God, I want to give you this sacrifice because I love you so much, because of how good you truly are. You are my cornerstone, so I want to give you my sacrifice. In the Old Testament, the animals were to be the best. Priests were not to give God their leftovers. They were not to insult God by offering blind and spotted and diseased animals. And also these sacrifices that they gave had to be according to God's direction. You don't approach God any way you want to as though it's a, just a flippant thing. I'm just going to go to God however I want to. No, you do it exactly as God prescribed. Which is why Peter says here concerning our spiritual sacrifices that the only sacrifices that are acceptable to God Look at the end of verse 5. He says here that we offer spiritual sacrifices that have to be acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. No other sacrifice is going to be accepted. So, what are these spiritual sacrifices? These spiritual sacrifices are really what it means to be a Christian. To live out your identity in Christ, that is a spiritual sacrifice. The church, one of the functions of the church is to stir up within the believers of the church the, the, the great joy of allowing God to be the one that you serve. We fulfill our priestly duties. That's what God has called us to do. They are spiritual in the sense that they are prompted by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. These are spiritual sacrifices. And so when a believer joyfully offers these sacrifices to God, he grows in maturity, and he grows in his faith. We talked about how to grow last time we met in verses 1 through 3. Another way is these steps of obedience. And so the Bible gives us six, at least six, I'm just going to spend time with these six spiritual sacrifices real quickly here. The first way in which you can have a spiritual sacrifice is by offering up your body. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that we present our bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So as a priest unto God, how do you sacrifice? One way is you come before God and say, God, this body that you have made, that you have created is for you. These hands, my mind, my feet, everything about me belongs to you. I am a living sacrifice. I'm a living stone that has been formed to a living sacrifice. I want to die to myself that I might live to Christ. That's a spiritual sacrifice. Also, Hebrews 13, 15 it speaks about our praise. When you worship God from your heart, it is a spiritual sacrifice. It says there in that verse that we offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips, listen to this phrase, that acknowledge his name. So again, you can do all of these with the wrong heart. 
But when you get your heart right, that is acceptable to God. And as priests, we come before God and say, God, I offer my body. God, I offer my praise. Even if, if it's not the best singing voice in the world, I still want to praise you and I want to worship you. I want to exalt you. That's a sacrifice. Thirdly, in Hebrews 13, 16, we see that our good works and our gifts are also spiritual sacrifices. It says there in that verse that we are not to neglect to do good, but to share what we have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. These are spiritual sacrifices. This is what it means to be a Christian. Furthermore, in Romans 15, verses 15 and 16, we see that our evangelism converts, the ones that we win to Christ, we can offer up to God and say, God, this is my spiritual sacrifice for you. You have done the work in saving this person. I've just been obedient, but I offer all the praise back to you. May no praise come to me for me simply being obedient to you. It says there in Romans 15, 16, that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's how Paul, when he would win somebody, he would offer it back to God. We also see our acts of love. You can love somebody, and in loving somebody, you are offering a spiritual sacrifice. It says in Ephesians 5 that we walk in love as Christ loved us, gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. People know that we've received the love of God when we love others. And finally, our prayers. In Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, there is this amazing scene that it says, The smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. And so when you pray, it's a picture of the smoke of incense going up before God, and God smells it and says, I am pleased that my child is praying to me. I'm pleased that they're coming to me and trusting me with the burdens and anxieties of their hearts. That church is a description of the spiritual sacrifices. This is your new purpose when you've received Christ. We've looked at the new identity, the new purpose, but there's also a new hope. If you look in verse number six, he says, for it stands in scripture. Scripture always stands. It never withers. He says there, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone. You see, our hope concerns the fact that we as Christians are marching to Zion. Zion used to be a hill in Jerusalem, and over time it became symbolic of several things. It's symbolic of God's gathered people. It became symbolic of the church. It became symbolic of the heavenly new Jerusalem. So anytime you see the word Zion, Z-I-O-N, written in the scripture, when the Israelites, when the Christians would read that, they thought about their hope. They thought about the fact that we're marching to Zion, and that God is keeping his promises, and that this place is not our home. So we're going to live for Zion. We're going to put all of our hope in what Christ has told us who we're going to be and where we're going to be, and they just march on to Zion. That's what it means to have a new hope. And it's a beautiful thing because verse 6 talks more about this hope it says, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. Listen to this phrase. Whoever believes in him, if you're saved today, that's you. If you, you believe in him, what does it say about you? If you're a Christian today, what does the Bible say about you? It says this, that you will not be put to shame. Actually, that phrase not means never, ever. It's a strong, emphatic word saying you will never, ever be put to shame. In other words, God does not disappoint. That word put to shame means to be disgraced, to be dishonored. It's a failure of expectation. And Peter says here, quoting Isaiah, that that will never, ever happen to anyone who is in Christ. No one will ever find God to be unfaithful to his promises. No one will ever get to heaven, see all the glories of heaven, shrug their shoulders and say, Eh, it's not that good. This place is not that big a deal. I've seen better. No one will ever do that. Why? Because the Bible says that we will not be disappointed. We will not be put to shame. In fact, this phrase also speaks about the fact that believers in Christ are forever secure in the hand of God. No one can snatch them out of his hand. It speaks about the fact that no one will separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You will not be disappointed. This is your new hope. You see, there are people, your neighbors, people you work with, people in your family that think, well, I'm a pretty good person. 
and, you, and, you, and when you put them in the corner and you start to talk to them a little bit, do you know that you're saved? Well, I don't know. I hope so. They don't know, but when you are saved, this is your hope. You will never be disappointed. Why? Because Christ is the cornerstone, not me. If I'm the cornerstone, the whole thing's going to fall apart. God does not disappoint. And so that leads to this wonderful third point, that when you have this new hope, you're going to see Christ as your precious foundation. Look at verse 7. It says, so the honor is for you who believe. Now, that phrase means that we have the honor of seeing Jesus as precious as God the Father sees Jesus. You remember back in verse 4 that I had told you that God saw Jesus, the chief cornerstone. He is chosen and precious to God. And in the same way, when you have Jesus as the cornerstone of your life, the foundation of your life, you also see him as precious. This is the opposite of those who reject him. Those who reject him look at the cornerstone, they examine it, and they spit on it. I don't want to have anything to do with that. But if you've been saved and you've received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, what happens is you look at that stone and you fall on your face and you say, Oh God, you are precious to me. You are everything to me. You are my God. You are my foundation. I give you everything. You are precious. This is an amazing thing. In Matthew 13, this is parable speaks about what Jesus should be to you. Matthew 13, verse 44. It says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys that field. That is what it means. Jesus is that treasure. We forsake everything else. We say, I'm going to forsake living for myself. I'm going to forsake living for pleasure. I'm going to forsake all of my idols. I'm going to forsake all of my religion, all of everything that I've lived for. Why? Because the treasure is worth it. He is precious to me. He is my everything. He is my cornerstone. He is my foundation. Nothing else satisfies like Christ. That's what that means. So you could receive Jesus. And when you receive Jesus, you'll have a new identity, a new purpose, and a new hope. In church, I want you to examine that cornerstone and see that he's worth it. But some of you are going to look at that cornerstone. You're going to reject it. Just like receiving Christ makes us new, rejecting Christ has eternal consequence. And we see that in verse 8. The first part of that eternal consequence is that those who reject Christ, again, they examine the cornerstone and they walk away from it, is that they disobey God's word. If you notice in verse 8, it says there that they, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, and they stumble because they disobey the word. Sin is disobedience to God's word. It is a rebellion against God's authority. When you disobey, it carries a strong sense that you refuse to believe. So, you're disobedient. But then you also determine your destination. In verse 8, you see there a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. This picture is a picture of the fact that the Jews saw God's choice for the Messiah, for the cornerstone. And they, it's as though the picture is that they picked up that stone and they rejected it. They threw it out of their way only to go about their business and trip over it and then that same stone be the stone that judges them. That's the picture that Peter is saying there. They rejected it. I don't want that cornerstone. Then they stumble over it, and then the stone crushes them. That's what it means when you disobey God and you determine your destination. See, God judges unbelievers as a consequence of their rejection of Christ and their disobedience to his word. God does not send people to hell. They are condemned already because of their sin. God saw you as a sinner, deserving hell, deserving separation from God, deserving nothing to do with heaven, right? And yet God did everything he could do to save you. He gives you this cornerstone, and yet we still look at the cornerstone and we say, I don't want that. 
I reject that, and we continue in our sin. But God has provided this cornerstone, and some of you have fallen on your knees, and you said, I love that cornerstone, and I want to give my life to that cornerstone. I want the cornerstone to be the foundation to everything that I am. And those that have that have been made new. But some of you who have rejected the cornerstone are condemned already because of your sin. You rebel against God's word. You reject God's cornerstone. So the question I asked you, I'm going to ask yet again. Have you received or rejected Christ as the foundation for your life? At this time, I want to invite our musicians and counselors to come into their spots Musicians can come up here on the stage. In just a minute, they're going to lead us in a hymn of invitation. Counselors will be over here in this door. Church, I want to encourage you to think about what's being said today. Today, you've examined Jesus. He may or may not fit your preconceived idea of what a Messiah should look like or what a Savior should even look like, but he is God's chosen and only way in order for you to be saved. You are separated from God, so you don't set the terms on how you could be saved. You rebelled against God, and God said, here's a way for you to be saved. Here's a way for you to be able to go to heaven. Here's a way for you to be able to have relationship with me. But some of you have rejected him. There are really only two responses to this cornerstone. Receive him or reject him. And maybe you've rejected him in the past. Maybe you've looked at your life and said, I don't want to live my life like that. I don't want to live for that cornerstone. I don't want him to be the foundation of my life. I just want to do a little religion here to there, but I don't want to fully surrender. And you've noticed in your heart there really hasn't been that much of a change. You haven't experienced that earthquake in your heart that I'm talking about that causes you to want to share about what Jesus is to you. So you can receive him or reject him, and maybe you've rejected him in the past, you don't have to keep rejecting him. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart today, today you can be saved. You can turn from your sin and say, God, I want you to be the cornerstone of my life. I no longer want to reject you. I no longer want to turn from you. I no longer want to walk away from you, God. But I trust you today to be the cornerstone for me, and Jesus will save you. If you reject him, you're going to remain in your sin. If you receive him, you can have forgiveness of sin. So here's the question I want you to think about. What will you do with this Jesus? You have to make that choice. Your answer to that question means everything. And so today, if you recognize in your heart that you've never truly allowed Jesus to be the cornerstone of your life, maybe you've played some religion, maybe you try to be a good person, is he your cornerstone? Is he your foundation? Is he your king, your Lord? I want to invite you today to bow your head with me. And today I'm going to ask you to pray after me. If you've never been saved today, never truly surrendered your heart, would you do that today? Just quietly between you and God, would you pray these words? Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I know my sin separates me from you. But God, I don't want to reject you anymore. I believe you are who your word says you are. You are the only way. And I'm asking you here today, God, to save me. Forgive me of all the times I've disobeyed you. Forgive me for trying to live my life for myself. Come into my life, God. Make me a living stone like you are the living stone. Give me this new identity, this new purpose, this new hope, God. Jesus, save me today. I believe you died on the cross for me, that you rose from the grave. Make me new. Save me today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want to invite you as we have this time of response, to come down and let me know about it so we can rejoice with you and give you instruction on what it means to be a follower of Christ. For others of you here today, you may need to come to these altars and pray for someone. You may need to come to one of these counselors, and they will pray for you.
If God has placed a burden on your heart, give it to Jesus. He is the cornerstone. Is your life aligned with him? Or are you trying to go off in a different direction? In a moment, we're going to have a Lord's Supper service. And if God has revealed to you that you don't have a right relationship with him and a right relationship with others, this time of invitation is a time for you to get right. Let's all stand together and we're going to have this time of response. I want to invite you to come to Jesus. He is the cornerstone. I'll be here in the front if you need me.
daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. Though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's and He will never forsake His own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. We are going to take this time and transition to the Lord's Supper. Did everybody get an opportunity to get a cup that has the bread on top of it? Brother Barry's here. Please slip up your hand if you do not have one. This time of the Lord's Supper is a time for those who are believers in Christ. Even if you're not a member of this church, if you are a professing believer in Christ, you are welcome to join us. But this is a serious time. It's a time where we reflect on what Jesus has done for us how he loved us, how he gave his life for us on the cross. And we are very undeserving of that. And because of what Jesus has done, we have new life. And so I want to read a passage of scripture found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And it is found in verse 23. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, And he said, do this in remembrance of me. And as we continue to read in verse 25, it says, in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Taking of the Lord's Supper is not something that saves anyone, but it's a ordinance where we remember what Jesus has done. And as I read there, we are to do it until Christ comes back. And it reminds us that our Lord is coming back for us. And he loved us so much that he died, gave his body, he shed his blood. And so we remember that. We teach our children that. We teach each other that because it is where we put our hope. And as we think about that wonderful sacrifice that Christ made for us, the most appropriate response is for us to sing. So Brother Jeff and the praise band is going to lead us. I want to encourage each of you to have a wonderful afternoon reflecting what Christ has done for you. And remember, tonight at 4 o'clock, we'll have that business meeting. Let's all stand together. God bless you for being here.